All right, well, thank you for joining us today. I'm Rex Malmstrom. I'm a scientist at the Joint Genome Institute and I'll be hosting this morning's session. And today we're gonna discuss modification, or well, we're gonna discuss the application of long read sequencing technologies to metagenomics and DNA modification detection. And it's our goal today to provide an overview of the, of the technologies available at JGI and how to access, their, access them through the user program. We're gonna collect the questions today through the Q&A feature of Zoom. And we'll take some time at the end of today's presentation to address these questions. We're also gonna make a recording of this webinar available uh, in a few days after this, along with written uh, answers to the questions we, we received. And finally, if we're not able to address your question today, or if you have a question that comes up later, don't hesitate to contact us. We're, we're here to help. All right, uh, first a little bit about us though. So the Joint Genome Institute is a US Department of Energy uh, user facility, and we're located in Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in the San Francisco Bay Area. We're world leaders in the genomics of microbes, plants, fungi, algae, and diverse environmental microbiomes. And we help researchers like yourself uh, characterize how these organisms and communities carry out complex biogeochemical processes and how these organisms can be harnessed for sustainable biofuels and bioproducts. And we have expertise in the area of DNA and RNA sequencing, DNA synthesis, metabolomics, and data analysis. Again, we're focused on projects related to biogeochemistry, biofuels, bioproducts. So studies that focus primarily on medicine or agricultural growth of food crops, they really wouldn't be appropriate for, for uh, they, those wouldn't be appropriate topics for our research institute. So as a, as a DOE user facility, it's our mission to work with scientists from around the world and apply our expertise in sequencing, synthesis, metabolomics, and data analysis to your research questions. Um, these capabilities are provided for free through a competitive peer review process called the Community Science Program or the CSP. And this point is important, uh, just in contrast to other agencies where accepted proposals are awarded funding when it comes to the JGI, successful proposals are awarded free access to these resources and to the expertise of the JGI. I'd like to point out that the deadlines for submitting letters of intent uh, for two of our proposal calls are approaching quickly. We have the LOI for the JGI MSL ficus uh, call, and this is where in one proposal you can access the capabilities of JGI and MSL. The LOI for that is on March 17th. And that's when the due date for the letters of intent are. They're pretty short, they're like a page long. The annual CSP call uh, is just working with the JGI. The letter of intent due date is March 24th. And you can see the, the dates for when the full proposals are due. Um, keep in mind, these are just the letters of intent. So, and this is the way to get your foot in the door. So make sure if you wanna uh, get something going, get your LOI in, and then you can adjust your proposal uh, as time goes on. Also as a reminder, uh, these calls uh, are open to scientists at international research institutes and postdocs are also eligible to apply to. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're hoping to provide a better understanding today of our long read sequencing capabilities and how you might incorporate them into your proposal. We're gonna hear about detecting uh, DNA uh, modification from George DiCenzo. He's an assistant professor at Queens University and we'll also hear from Mark Van Gotham, a postdoctoral researcher at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab on how he's been using long read sequencing in metagenomic analysis of complex communities. Uh, before we get to our guest speakers though, I'm gonna turn it over to Emily Ayla Fadrash. She is the JGI's, uh, the head of the JGI's metagenomics program and she's gonna provide some additional information on uh, our capabilities. And uh, again, I encourage you to submit questions through the Q&A feature as we go. All right, Emily, stage is yours. 
Great, thanks Rex and welcome everybody. Um, I uh, lead the Metagenome Program at the JGI and I'm also joined behind the scenes uh, with Simon Rue who leads the Viral Genomics Group and Alicia Klum who leads the Genome uh, Assembly and Annotation Group. And we're happy to answer uh, questions as they come out uh, throughout the webinar today. So for those of you who may not be familiar with the JGI or the Metagenome Program specifically, I wanted to provide some information about our strategic directions and scientific drivers uh, that really underpin uh, the work that we do at the JGI and the capabilities that we try to enable for the user community. And these include phylogenomic novelty, so being able to identify uh, uh, uncultivated bacteria and archaea that have not been characterized, uh, viral host interactions, and identifying environmental viruses that infect microbes, um, and then using function-driven metagenomics and specifically coupling uh, metagenome sequencing with stable isotope probing to try to get at the active microbial members within a community. And these uh, strategic directions are underpinned by uh, several key approaches. Uh, we uh, provide genome-resolved metagenomic capabilities. Uh, we do large-scale microbiome data mining activities uh, using our uh, IMG uh, computational platform. And then, as I mentioned, we develop and try to scale environmental methods uh, using um, a variety of techniques. And so if you're interested in more information, uh, please visit the JGI website and specifically the JGI strategic plan uh, for a lot of our ongoing activities and how we are trying to enable the user community uh, through uh, metagenomics. So I did want to highlight uh, metagenomics has traditionally uh, been done using short read sequencing uh, for other um, isolate genomes, for plants, uh, bacteria, archaea, and fungi, uh, long read sequencing has been applied uh, for many years at the JGI, but more recently, um, we're trying to apply this technique. Uh, so traditionally, uh, bulk DNA extraction um, has been done from diverse samples. These include samples uh, from complex soil communities or uh, less diverse uh, hot spring environments. And we have uh, several uh, low input protocols um, that really require just nanograms of DNA and no requirement for high molecular weight DNA. So over the past several years, we've uh, been enabling uh, you user projects to accomplish uh, bulk metagenome sequencing, generating millions of short reads, and more recently enabling uh, metagenome uh, assembly and metagenome assembled genomes specifically. Uh, we use the NovaSeq platform uh, to generate terabases worth of uh, data, and this really enables deep sequencing. And uh, just within the past few years, we've had a Metaspades assembly method um, and automated binning. But I would like to point out that there still remain significant challenges with this short read assembly in complex environments. Oops and uneven composition and even inter and interspecies heterogeneity that presents many challenges for doing short read sequencing. And thus we are very excited to leverage uh, long read sequencing techniques for metagenomics. And this has been enabled by the SQL2 platform that was um, up and running within the JGI in January of 2019. And some of the highlights um, for the benefits of the SQL2 platform compared to previous uh, uh, machines and technologies is that it uses the same smart uh, technology as previous platforms, but it has a much higher uh, increased capacity um, with a lot lower cost. So this has really enabled um, us to scale. We also um, have a much higher quality of data coming out of the SQL 2. Um, and importantly, we've been able to uh, do samples uh, with a much lower um, amount of uh, DNA that has really been one of the key barriers for applying uh, long read sequencing technologies for metagenomes. So this is a snapshot of uh, the uh, sample submission requirements. We are in the process of developing uh, low input protocols, which will further enable really unique and diverse samples that have traditionally been uh, challenging to do long read sequencing because it requires micrograms worth of DNA. 
I would also like to highlight that uh, we have a methylation detection using the base modification analysis tool within the PacBio SmartLink. Um, and we can actually do this uh, base detection within metagenomes uh, depending on the coverage and the organisms uh, that are being sequenced. Uh, in terms of analysis, uh, we do long read only assemblies using Metafly. Um, in the past, we have done hybrid assemblies and we can get into um, some more details in the Q&A if you're interested in our analysis capabilities. So I just wanted to highlight two very quick examples uh, for how uh, long read metagenomics uh, has been applied for user projects. The first is on the left hand side, a project uh, led by Daniel Naguro through the University of Wisconsin. And this is a, a bioenergy research center project where they were very interested in using long read sequencing or pack bio sequencing from their um, uh, communities within bioreactors. And what we were able to do with his team is to do methylation detection and pattern matching for the dominant microbes within these bioreactor environments and link the uh, putative viruses that um, uh, are associated with those dominant microbes. So this is a really interesting way of using um, methylation detection uh, within this bioreactor system. Um, on the right hand side is a different example that I would like to highlight, uh, led by Frank Stewart out of uh, Georgia Tech, and they were very interested in trying to disentangle uh, strain heterogeneity within SAR11 or the Pelagibacter uh, clade within oxygen minimum zones, and what they were able to find, and there's a publication that uh, just recently came out, uh, was they were able to recover uh, genomes of two separate species within this particular clade. Played, and that was only enabled using this long read sequencing technology. So I think there's a lot of very exciting opportunities and we look forward to partnering uh, with you um, if you are interested in doing long read sequencing. So just to highlight again what Rex had said for the upcoming calls, the FICOS call, the annual CSP and new investigator, uh, we're allowing uh, for up to four long read metagenomes with a target of 250 gigabases per sample uh, to be recorded requested. So um, if those are of interest, uh, please be in touch with us um, as you develop your proposal. All right, with that, I am very excited uh, to present uh, George DiCenzo, who is an assistant professor in microbiology um, at uh, uh, in the Queen's uh, University. And I am going to uh, hand it over to him to talk uh, specifically about DNA methylation detection in bacteria. So George, uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Emily. And thanks for this opportunity to speak today. So as mentioned, I'll use this time to talk a bit about our work using PAC viral sequencing to look at DNA methylation in the genus Ensifer, which contains a number of bacteria that are plant associated, some of which are nitrogen fixing symbionts of legumes. So I think when many people think of DNA methylation bacteria, the first thing that comes to mind are restriction modification systems. So these systems are often thought of as phage defense systems, but in addition to this kind of defense role, DNA methylation can also be involved in regulation. One notable example is the DAM methyltransferase of the gamma proteobacteria, which is involved in regulation of DNA replication and DNA repair in those organisms. Another important example that will be relevant for today's talk is a CCRM methyltransferase. So CCRM stands for cell cycle regulated methyltransferase. And as the name implies, it's involved in cell cycle regulation. This schematic shows an overview of CCRM activity across the cell cycle. And CCRM is active specifically at the end of the cell cycle corresponding to the end of DNA replication. Throughout the rest of the cell cycle, this enzyme is not active. So in this image, blue DNA is unreplicated, orange is newly replicated, with gray boxes indicating CCRM uh, sites that are methylated by CCRM, with both boxes being gray indicating methylated on both strands, while the a gray and white box indicates only one strand is methylated, which is known as hemimethylated. So as, as DNA replication proceeds, you get a progressive switch from fully methylated sites to hemimethylated as the newly synthesized strand would be non-methylated and it only becomes fully methylated again at the end of the cell cycle. And the switch between fully methylated and hemimethylated status influences expression of nearby genes. 
So my main model system are a group of bacteria known as rhizobia. Rhizobia are bacteria that live free in the soil and are perfectly happy living by themselves in the soil. But they also enter into an endosymbiotic relationship with legume plants. During this relationship, they take atmospheric enter gas and convert it into ammonia, which is provided to the plant as a source of nitrogen. And it allows the plant to thrive even in soils that are nitrogen deficient. So I'd like to show these three images that are on this slide here, as they do a nice job of demonstrating the, the benefit of rhizobia, as half of the plants are inoculated and half are not inoculated. I think it's immediately evident that the inoculated plants are much healthier than the non-inoculated ones. So to look a bit closer at the actual symbiosis, the bacteria are found in this specialized organ known as the root nodule, which has a characteristic pink color due to the presence of light hemoglobin that maintains a low oxygen, free oxygen concentration. Nodules such as those from biofalfa actually consist of spatially distinct developmental zones. And the, it's a bit difficult to see in this image, but the tip of the nodule is white, not pink. So this white zone, which I'll also refer to as zone two later in this talk, is the zone where the bacteria infect the, the legume cells and they undergo a process known as differentiation, in which they switch from being free living cells to what are known as nitrogen fixing bacteroids. So this is the infection in the developmental zone. The pink part of the nodule corresponds to zone three and that's the nitrogen fixing zone where mature bacteroids undergo are actively fixing nitrogen. So that this process of differentiation involves dramatic changes to the cell. This top micrograph here shows is of a free living rhizobium grown in a test tube. And you can see they have nice small cell sizes that look fairly normal for bacteria. This bottom micrograph is an image of the exact same strain of rhizobium, but instead of being grown in a test tube, it was isolated from a legume nodule. You can see they're massively enlarged. They also have multiple copies of the genome. They can have up to 20 copies of the genome per cell. And they also experience very, they have very different transcriptomes, proteomes, metabolic profiles, and so on. So it's a very complex process, this differentiation. So we've learned a lot about the transcription factors involved in regulating nitrogen fixation in rhizobia, but we, we still have much to learn about the regulation of differentiation and also its biological significance. And so we came into this project with the question, is methylation of rhizobium DNA an important regulatory mechanism that helps control bacteroid development or nitrogen fixation? And so we addressed this question using long read sequencing technologies, PAC biosequencing to detect DNA modifications on rhizobium genomes. So we chose to work with four strains from the genus Ensifer. So this genus can be largely divided into two subclades. One clade consists predominantly of strains that are legume nitrogen fixing symbionts, and that's shown by the blue. And the red is the second clade, which consists predominantly of non-symbiont. Non so we picked three symbiotic strains and one non-symbiotic strain to include our analysis. And we examined their DNA methylation patterns in different conditions. So we grew them with different carbon sources to see the impact of nutrient environment, or we grew them to mid exponential phase or to stationary phase when they're no longer dividing. We also looked for the two Ensifer melody strains. We examined them also in during nitrogen fixation or what their DNA methylation looks like in, the, in nodules. So we, we inoculated the strains on alfalfa plants. Some of those are shown here on the right. And then after four to five weeks, we isolated the nodules, crushed them, purified the bacteroids, and then isolated the DNA. In addition to isolating DNA from whole nodule samples, we took use of the fact that the nodules have spatially distinct developmental zones to investigate DNA methylation at different stages of development. So we manually sectioned the nodules at the white pink border and separated the zone two part of the nodule from zone three. These tubes just show solutions in which the nodule sections were crushed. You can see the ones corresponding to zone three have the nice red color from like hemoglobin. Once the zone two are nice and white indicating a lack of like hemoglobin, suggesting that the sections were properly separated from each other. This was further confirmed using flow cytometry data and fluorescence microscopy which show we do have two distinct types of cell populations between the zone two and zone three samples. But for the sake of time, I won't show those figures. 
So we took all of this DNA, in most cases we sent it off to the JGI and they did the pack viral sequencing and sent us data. And with that data, we were able to identify a total of six motifs that were methylated across the four strains. Five of the six motifs that were methylated in the strains were methylated specifically in a single strain. So it was not conserved. This suggests that the biological roles of these methyl transferases and this methylation is not evolutionary conserved across the genus. In addition, if we looked in the different conditions, we found the exact same motifs methylated, whether the cells are grown as sucrose or succinate as a carbon source, whether they were exponentially growing cells or in non-dividing stationary phase cells, or whether they were bacteroids isolated from nodules or grown in a test tube. We also did not find any evidence that any of these motifs were enriched in the promoter sequences of genes differentially expressed by carbon source, differentially expressed across the cell cycle, or differentially expressed between bacteroids and free living cells. So overall, the evidence was consistent with DNA methylation in general, not having an important regulatory role in the genus Ensifer. The exception is for cell cycle regulation. So the, I said five of the six motifs were strain specific. One motif, GANTC, was found in all six of the strain or all four of the strains. So this is the motif that is methylated by the CCRM methyltransferase involved in cell cycle regulation. So it was expected to see this motif methylated in all four strains. What was surprising, however, was that the frequency of the motif across the genomes differed in the four strains. So it was about 1.6 to 1.7 sites per kilobase of DNA in the three symbiotic strains. There was only about 1.1 sites per kilobase in the non-symbiotic strain. Of course, this is a relatively small sample size. It could just be by chance that we see this difference. And so we went and downloaded 157 genomes from across the, the genus and asked, what is the frequency of these sites in the different genomes? And so what we saw was that in the symbiotic clade, we had about 1.7 GANTC sites per kilobase of genome. In the non-symbiotic strains or the non-symbiotic clade, it averaged only 1.06, so about 60% fewer or 40% fewer at GANTC sites than the symbiotic clade. Now, we don't know why there's this pretty dramatic difference between the two clades, but it is tempting to speculate that maybe it's somehow linked to legume symbiosis. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that bacteroids are enlarged and polyploid compared to the free living cells. And so this indicates that there's a cell cycle transition that's happening during the process of differentiation. Given that CCRM is involved in the cell cycle, we chose to look deeper into the pattern of G GANTC methylation across the genomes of the two and melody strains that we included at both free living and symbiotic data for. So the next few slides will have a number of figures that look like this. The X axis is the chromosome position from the first nucleotide to the last one. It's important to remember that the chromosome is circular. So even though it's shown as a linear figure here, the, the two ends do come around and connect. And nucleotide position one roughly corresponds to the origin of replication. The Y axis is the extent of methylation of a given site within the cell population. And this is estimated based on the fraction of reads that are predicted to be methylated that map to that region. So value of one would mean that all cells in the population have that site methylated on both strands. A value of 0 0.5 would indicate that all cells in the population have that site as hemimethylated, so only one strand is methylated. So this is data for stationary phase cells that are no longer growing. And shown in black are the GANTC motifs, and gray is a second motif that's just shown for comparison, uh, with each dot representing a 10 kilobase sliding window. And so what we see is that in this condition, we have a relatively or consistently high level of near full methylation across the chromosome, which is what we'd expect. We see a quite different pattern in the exponentially growing cells, although again, this was not a surprising result. In this case, we see relatively low methylation near the origin of replication, which progressively increases until you get to the terminus of replication. So if we think back to the activity of CCRM, these are non-synchronized cell populations in which cells are randomly at different stages of the cell cycle. And so we'd expect that at any given time, most cells would have replicated the start of the genome, 
but not the end. And so most cells would have hemimethylated near the origin with progressively fewer cells having the rest, having the rest of the genome replicated and thus being having a higher extent of methylation. Now, although these two results were expected, what was quite surprising was the results we saw in the bacteroids. So on the left is the data for strain RM2011. On the right is the data for FSMMA. And this is for the bacteroids purified from whole nodules. And it's quite striking the difference compared to free living cells. Overall, there's a lower average extent of methylation across the chromosome compared to the free living cells. It also has a different pattern where unlike exponential free cells, in this case, it starts as higher methylation near the origin, progressively decreasing until you get to the terminus. We see more or less the same pattern if we look at the bacteroids purified from the zone three section, so corresponding to mature nitrogen fixing bacteroids. If we look at zone two, so those developing bacteroids undergoing differentiation, we see the same pattern in the RM2011 strain. We see a quite different pattern in FSM MA. We have an overall higher level of methylation that's at a relatively consistent level across the chromosome. So we can't say with 100% certainty why these two why these patterns differ between these two strains, but our flow cytometry data is consistent with the FSM MA strain representing an earlier stage of differentiation than RM2011. So we think this is the pattern in strains in an early stage of differentiation. This is the pattern in a late stage of differentiation. So what does this all mean? Our interpretation of this is that there's a dysregulated and constitutive CCRM activity during bacteroid differentiation. And so this causes all CCRM sites or GANTC sites to be methylated as they're replicated. This is quite interesting as there is a previous study that showed that if you artificially induce constitutive CCRM activity in free living agrobacterium cells, you can you get cells that somewhat resemble bacteroids in that they're enlarged compared to normal cells and they have multiple copies of the, their genome. So that study combined with our data, we hypothesized that this constitutive CCRM activity is one of the driving factors for endo reduplication during bacteroids differentiation. In terms of why you have, we have the smiling face, we think that's because CCRM activity is likely lost during the final round of endo reduplication. So any final DNA re replication happening after CCRM activity is lost would result in hemimethylated sites. So to summarize, overall, our data suggests that outside of cell cycle regulation, DNA methylation is not likely to be a major mechanism of gene expression regulation in the genus Ensifer. We also pro provide evidence that dysregulated constitutive CCRM activity may be one of the driving factors for endo reduplication during bacteria differentiation, which we think is a rather interesting observation, particularly when considered together with some other results that are known about differentiation. And so I'll, I'll also note that if you're interested in reading more about this work, our preprint on the study was posted to our archive two days ago. So it's a little self-promotion, feel free to go check out that paper if you wanna learn a bit more about this work. And I'll finish off by just thanking everybody that was involved in this study, particularly Alessio and Peter. Uh, th thanks to the JGI who supported the majority of the sequencing work in this study through one of the new investigator programs and without the sequencing by the JGI, this project wouldn't have been possible. And both for a short-term fellowship to visit Peter's lab and NSERC both for supporting me as a postdoc when this work started and now for supporting the research in my lab. Okay, so with that, I'll stop and I'll pass it off to Mark Van Gortem, who will be presenting about the use of long read sequencing in metagenomics. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them if you post them in the Q&A. All right, hi everybody. I hope you can hear me clearly and you can see my screen as well. I'm gonna take you on a walk through some advances in de novo metagenomic assembly using long read technology with sequencing that was done here at the JGI. Okay. Oh, I need to move the panel. Sorry about that. There's always gonna be something. All right, so shotgun metagenomics has dramatically advanced what we know about uh, microbial ecology. 
And this is because most microbes evade cultivation and cannot be grown in the lab on a petri dish, such as this one. But recent advan advances in sequencing and assembly have been able to shed light on the evolutionary and ecological principles at play in natural systems. So we circumvent the need to cultivate anything by simply sequencing uh, the entire community. Okay, now I go. So commonly we use uh, short read metagenomic sequencing, which has a lot of technical drawbacks. Uh, there's, obviously, there's a computationally intense assembly process uh, and many difficulties dealing with peak regions. And Emily mentioned a few other difficulties earlier. So instead, we can use long read sequencing for metagenomics and not just for genomics anymore. And it's not just possible, but it's actually practical. And we're now able to overcome a lot of the input requirements uh, barriers to broader application in microbial ecology. And as a case study, I'll show you uh, my postdoc work on complex soil communities, specifically BioCrust, using PacBio smart sequencing. So what we aimed to do was explore the soil microbiome for novel secondary metabolites. And so we decided to sequence BioCrust using both short and long read sequencing, all at the JGI. And so let's start. What are BioCrust communities? Uh, on the right, you can see an image of an organo sedimentary assemblage of microbes that physically hold soil particles together and prevent erosion. They're thought to literally hold down uh, part of the United States and prevent erosion on a dramatic scale. And while we know a lot about these communities in terms of their taxonomy and their basic functionality, uh, not much is known regarding the uh, how microbes compete uh, using secondary metabolites such as antibiotics. So antibiotics are commonly produced by soil microbes and it allows for competition between microbes. In fact, something like 80% of our antibiotics used today come from natural sources such as soil. So the problem is that secondary metabolites are encoded by extremely long biosynthetic gene clusters that are typically between 10 and 100,000 base pairs long and extremely repetitive, meaning that short read sequencing simply doesn't work. In fact, the short reads produced by Illumina, for example, simply don't even cover the, the repeat sequence. So instead, could we use long read sequencing to unearth the secondary metabolism of BioCrust? So when your cluster is this long, you've got an 80,000 base pair cluster encoding uh, Jacksonicin biosynthesis. Um, it's very difficult to capture all of this with, with short read sequencing and assembly. So our sequencing strategy was to extract high molecular weight DNA from one BioCrust sample using this a regular commercial kit. And we use the same DNA extract for sequencing in a number of ways. So we're gonna compare how PAC bio performs against Illumina. And we have a number of metagenomes produced from the sequencing of this bio crust. And we even compare different assemblers. We tried some co-assemblies. And then at the end, we looked at how they recovered biosynthetic gene clusters or not. And importantly, we also compare different library threads. We have low input ones here, as well as some high input ones too. So I don't mean to overwhelm you with a whole bunch of data in the form of a table, but essentially I'll just walk you through the type of data we have. We have three metagenomes from the RS2 sequencer, four from the SQL, which was the SQL to RS2, and a single SQL2 metagenome, that is the latest and greatest in tech biosynthesis technology. And it is a low input uh, library with amplification done as well. And we also compare this to two Illumina data sets. And the numbers involved are simply the, the highest values. So the Illumina data, unsurprisingly, produced way more reads, orders of magnitude more in some cases, but they don't actually contain as many nucleotides as SQL2, for example. So they don't capture as much information. The other advantage of long read sequencing is that you get a very good N50 value starting, meaning that the, the raw reads from the sequencing are already pretty long, some of which are over 100,000 base pairs in length. 
And so we find that most of the community is captured through this sequencing approach. And we can look at read redundancy to estimate our sequencing effort. And on average, about 70% of the community is getting sequenced in every occasion. And we can see that there are massive improvements with every uh, generation of tag bio that we analyze. And they actually capture more of the community than do the Illumina sequences, even though there is an order of magnitude more sequences there. And that's great, but how do they assemble? So for the long reads, we use two prominent tools, GNU and Metify, one of which Emily already mentioned. And the way these work is to correct uh, base calling errors, which is pretty high in long read sequencing. They then do trimming and assembly using repeat graphs instead of the brain graphs. And what this means is that they use proximate matches among uh, related reads instead of exact matches to reveal repeats. So this accounts for the error rates in the fact by your reads. And so the long reads can traverse repeat regions when we map it onto the graph. So if we look at the sequence, you know, X, a couple of repeats, Y, a couple of repeats, Z, B, and U, we can see using a repeat graph that you can account for the repeats, their, their occurrence, three B repeats and two A repeats, and you can retain the order of the sequence. And you can deconvolute this into a simplified graph. And these final graphs are then used to generate the contents. So with that in mind, let's look at some assembly statistics. Once again, the Illumina data sets produce way more contents. But the, I guess the downside is that these are generally very, very short. So they're accumulating a lot of very short contents. SQL 2, by comparison, is only 20,000 contents, but that comprises a lot of data, uh, 500 uh, megabases. You get very high in 50s across the, uh, the long read assemblies. The longest contig we uh, created here was over 700,000 base pairs in length. And in this column, we're looking at contigs that are longer than 10,000 base pairs, 10 KB, because these will be useful for discovering biosynthetic gene clusters, which are generally very long. And so we can see immediately that the SQL2 data is very, very useful in this that it provided 14,000 contents longer than 10 KB, comprising most of the sequencing effort, whereas Illumina just doesn't have that many. So I got really into assembling the metagenomes and we wanted to see how far we could take this. And so we decided to co-assemble some of these metagenomes as well. Um, so we've already seen that long read assembly improves on the contiguity of short read assemblies. And so we co-assembled uh, whole metagenomes together to try and improve yield or PGC recovery. So I co-assembled the two Illumina datasets with the four sequels using hybrid metaspace all four of the SQL uh, metagenomes together using Metafly, as well as the four SQL metagenomes with the SQL2 metagenome also using Metafly. And this turned out to be a winning combination in terms of recovering biosynthetic gene clusters. So looking at the assembly statistics again, we can see that the Illumina and SQL data produce a lot of contexts, but generally that these are very short based on the N50 value of just 2,000. Whereas these co-assemblies produced way more data, including extremely long contexts, which would be very useful for discovering gene clusters. And once again, many of these are going to be useful for our analysis. So how many biosynthetic gene clusters did we get recover per assembly? We can see that the, the SQL, SQL2 co-assembly was by far the best approach, recovering over a thousand biosynthetic gene clusters, many of which are novel sequences and a lot of which are full length, meaning that the, the gene cluster isn't trunca truncated on either of the contact edges. Whereas, for example, the Illumina data between those two metagenomes produce 300 BGCs, just nine of which are full length, meaning that we're not actually capturing the full gene cluster and we're probably missing very relevant information. 
So to show this in a bit more of an attractive way, we can look at the number of DGCs across each metagenome. So from one to over a thousand. And we can see the green lines is the is co-assembly. And quite simply, it doubles the depth and breadth of uh, the number of BGCs that we, we can pull out of these, these metagenomes. That's not to say that some of the other co-assemblies aren't very good. But yeah, the long reads essentially is what's catapulted this analysis. And so just to talk some biology at the end, we found that cyanobacteria produced most of the BGCs or encoded most. They are the dominant species for phylum in these communities. And so this isn't a surprise. And we found that non-ribosomal peptide synthetases were the most common, common class of secretory metabolites as well. And oh, oh, we're going too fast. I'll show you one really cool example of BGCs that we've detected. So we found these two siderophores that seemed very, very similar in structure. And we found that they're actually rearrangements of each other. There's transposase that causes uh, this, this kind of crazy uh, synteny plot between the two. And when we map transcripts onto here, we can actually see that they experience different transcriptional regulation profiles, for example. And this would not have been uh, possible without the long reads. These came from the, that very large co-assembly. So in summary, obviously long read sequencing is pretty great and it provides access to ultra long contexts, which has major benefits for ecological studies, whether you are looking at secondary metabolites, trying to detect plasmids or recover genomes of bacteria or viruses. Importantly, a low input library is also very useful, such as the uh, SQL2 uh, metagene. And we anticipate that this would be useful in other systems as well. And we, on this side, I also compared some existing data uh, to recover BGCs from Lake Biwa, which is obviously an aquatic sample, and from a biogas reactor. And we found that co-assembling with long reads dramatically increased the number of, of biosynthetic gene clusters that you could recover from these systems too. So whether you're looking at any of these systems, uh, long read sequencing is probably going to be pretty valuable uh, in your arsenal of, of sequencing. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I'd like to acknowledge everyone that's worked on these projects, including the Northern Lab, as well as a few people at the JGI that have, that have helped uh, with all these analyses and assemblies. And Tulani Makalanwane that is hosting me in South Africa while I'm here. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mark. That was a great presentation. Uh, now we have a chance to do a live uh, Q&A with some of the panelists. So uh, George and Emily, uh, if you don't mind uh, joining us here, uh, we'll have a few questions. And actually, I want to start off. I, I have a couple specific questions, Mark, uh, for you, specific about the presentation you just gave. Uh, so, for example, uh, did you make any ad adaptations to the power soil DNA extraction? And did you generate hi-fi reads with the SQL 2? Yeah, so in honesty, I didn't do, <laughs> do the sequencing myself. Um, but yeah, I think uh, Tammy, who did the, the extractions, I don't think she did anything too fancy from, from our side, as far as I'm aware, just a normal extraction. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have another question here uh, about uh, metagenome or, or sort of packed by metagenomes. And Alicia, I think you might be better, best able to address this. So how does the correction that is done in pack file compared to doing polishing with Illumina reads? Yeah, so we found um, by and large that it's not necessary to polish with both. So, and um, generally, it's more efficient for us just to make a single library type. So the work that was done with Mark was kind of R&D, so it's not necessarily typical that we would have both data sets. Um, if you do have both Illumina and PacBio, you can certainly um, 
the recommendation there is to polish with the pack bio and then do a round, uh, a subsequent round with the Illumina data. Um, this is what the plant group uh, does because they normally generate Illumina data to do an evaluation, but it's not strictly necessary as you can get finished quality microbial data um, polishing with just the pack bio data. Thanks, Alicia. Uh, I have another question here uh, for Mark and Alicia. I think this could be for either of you guys. Uh, did you see any advantage using ultra long reads in assembly? Uh, Mark, were, were ultra long reads used in with your soils? We don't. Yeah, so, well, yeah, go ahead. The question I think specifically is about Oxford nanopore. We unfortunately. Oh, was that? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't catch that part. Um, I think that's planned, but we don't currently have Oxford nanopore um, for this project. A lot of, um, due to the pandemic, we've had to sort of be a little bit pickier about the R&D that we're doing. And uh, most of the Oxford R&D has um, been used to study uh, direct RNA sequencing. Um, so we haven't looked at that many Oxford data sets for metagenomes, but those reads are um, can be quite a bit longer. So that's definitely something that we're interested in looking at more. Thanks, Alicia. Yeah, for these for these current calls, like where we're at right now, Oxford nanopore isn't uh, something that that is requested. I think all the long read sequencing is being done on the pack bio at, at the moment. So. Okay, uh, Mark, another question for you uh, specifically about your findings, basically asking about uh, the fact that cyanos have, have more biosynthetic gene clusters than the actinos, and that was a surprising result. Uh, do you have any uh, follow-up to that yeah, I mean, uh, observation? Yeah, so it is a, a pretty cool observation. So cyanos dominate like 50% of these communities, and so naturally most of the sequences belong to those genomes, but also they, they seem to encode a whole bunch of, of completely novel BGCs. Yeah, there are actinos, as there are in most soils, and they did produce produce a few, but yeah, they're just not the dominant organism or phylum in this in this case. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Emily, I have uh, some some practical questions for you. Uh, so, how much DNA is needed for a regular versus an ultra low input library in terms of uh, well, for library creation protocols on PacBio? Yeah, thanks, Rex. Uh, for metagenome sequencing specifically, we typically require about uh, one and a half micrograms. Um, that's for our uh, standard protocols. Um, as I mentioned, we are trying to develop the low input protocols, and um, it's a continual uh, process uh, to try to improve, but that um, requires about uh, 30 to 100 nanograms. Um, and I should also note that uh, beyond just the quantity itself, the quality is obviously very important. As you uh, heard from Mark, we we're able to generate uh, three KB libraries, um, but certainly that's not taking advantage of, you know, the much longer reads. And so having uh, intact high molecular weight DNA is really important for doing uh, pack bio metagenomes. Yeah, thanks, Emily. That, that this, this uh, issue of, how, of the DNA requirements for pack bio has, has sort of been one of the key limitations for, I think, a lot of systems. So the ability to use the ultra low input could open it up for many more. Uh, I know you mentioned that uh, the limits in the call for proposals is for about 250 gigabase pairs uh, of sequencing, but could you explain like what does that turn into in terms of the, the number of pack bio libraries and how deeply they would be sequenced? And... Yeah, sure. So um, I, as I mentioned, um, for these upcoming calls, uh, users can request up to four uh, pack bio metagenomes, and that does not count towards the one uh, terabase cap. Um, and that also uh, we target about uh, 250 uh, gigabases worth of data, and we typically do not pool um, samples uh, for uh, the sequencing of that on the pack bio machine. Um, what that uh, can lead to is on average about 180 uh, gigabases. Um, it can range anywhere from about 50 to at best the 250 that we target. Um, but you could likely expect um, a, an average of about of, of 180. Thank you. 
Uh, what type of support does JGI provide for DNA modification detection? Is it something that's just microbes? Can it be done in metagenomes? Um, yeah, and I, I can certainly have Alicia um, uh, provide some uh, uh, answer to this as well. Um, but we uh, use the uh, PacBio um, base modification analysis tool. Um, and that works well for detecting the 6MA and 4MC. Um, if you have about a 50x uh, depth coverage uh, within a metagenome, and so you need that really high coverage to be able to make those um, uh, methylation detections. Um, for other, uh, you know, uh, less uh, well-suited uh, detections for like uh, 5MC, you need um, actually about a 250X depth coverage um, so that those uh, types of modifications are more challenging to detect. And currently uh, beyond those three, it's very hard within metagenomes to make um, additional methylation detections. Right, thank you, Emily. Uh, we had, when Alicia mentioned earlier when there was a question about improving uh, read quality and, and doing hybrid, uh, you know, through by polishing, uh, you know, we, we found that wasn't that particularly helpful. And then Mark's data was also showing that the hybrid assemblies of Illumina versus and PacBio were not necessarily superior to what we could get from PacBio only. So I know that currently that those assemblies are just, uh, we're not doing uh, Illumina PacBio hybrid assemblies at the moment, but if someone wanted to map the short read meta, if they had paired metadata and wanted to map short read metagenomes to their long read assemblies, is that something that JGI can do? And how could those data be shared? Um, yes, that is something that we can do. And it actually is a, a very good um, study design if you're interested in trying to look at overall coverage um, within the community and relative abundances um, and leveraging the long read um, assemblies to get a better recovery of uh, those population genomes. Um, so uh, this uh, would probably be best suited for a discussion with JGI staff as you're developing um, your proposal uh, and uh, thinking about um, how to do this uh, within uh, the context of what the goals of the, the study are. Um, we do have some examples of projects where um, we do um, enable the mapping. It, we don't currently have the capabilities to host that data within uh, the IMG platform, um, but those uh, the read mapping analysis would be posted within the JGI genome portals and uh, users would be able to access that data uh, through that um, uh, portal. All right, thank you, Emily. And, and thanks to everyone. Uh, these, that's all the questions that we've received today. So uh, I appreciate that. Uh, I think I just have a few closing thoughts then. And so, and so I'll just uh, go forward with those. Um, just a quick reminder for folks. Uh, well, actually, before I do this reminder, again, thanks to George and Mark uh, for, for your presentations today. They're very interesting and informative. And, and thanks to those of you who participated in today's events. Uh, if you have any other questions that come up later, feel free to reach out uh, and, and we'll be happy to try and answer them. Uh, I wanted to remind you again that uh, we have two, the deadlines for the letters of intent for two different calls for proposals are coming up quickly on March 17th and 24th. But again, these are just sort of the letters of intent stage and you have more time to craft a full proposal, especially if you heard anything today that you would like to incorporate into that, uh, into that proposal. Um, let's see here. Uh, There's uh, plenty of other ways to learn about JGI and our capabilities. Uh, we're gonna be offering more webinars. And if any of you are actually interested in fungi, we have another webinar tomorrow. It's a tutorial on the microcosm portal. So you can check that out. You can also go to this website here to the user programs. You can learn about all different calls for proposals. There's a lot of different information. Or you can also send e uh, emails to these two addresses here to get more information. Or if you know anyone at JGI, or at, feel free to just send us an email. We're, we're here to help. And we, we would love to uh, provide more advice. 
And then finally, if you're interested in following us, uh, you can do that on, uh, on various different media plat platforms, including YouTube. Uh, we have a JGI YouTube channel and you can see videos of past webinars. And in a week or so, we should have a copy of this one up and posted. You can follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. And then you can also check out a couple podcasts that we, uh, that we put out. I think they're, uh, you might find those interesting on some of the work that other JGI scientists or uh, scientists collaborating with the JGI and what it is they're doing. Okay, well, that does it for today. I hope we provided some useful information and good luck writing your proposals. We look forward to reading them. Take care. Bye-bye.